The Lord be with you. And with us spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, who in creating human nature has wonderfully dignified it and still more wonderfully reformed it, grant that we may become partakers of his divine nature, who deigned to partake of our human nature, thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, throughout all ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Some years ago in Wichita Falls, <coughs> a lady contacted me about visiting the parish. She was interested in orthodoxy. She worked for a member of our parish, and he was always talking about the church, so she was curious. Uh, she wanted to come in and observe just so she'd at least have a context for whatever it was he was talking about. Afterwards, she'd gone home and gone about her business. She sent me an email, and she asked me the question that I pose today. And that is, why do Orthodox Christians sing every prayer and every service? And it was really funny because I'd never really thought about it. Just something we did. Uh, so she set me on the stage of, of contemplating this, and it just all seemed so natural to sing everything. And then as I began to investigate, it just struck me that why we do this. Everything that I had studied over the years started falling in place. So I want to start with, that's the question for today. Why do, why do you people sing everything? Why do you sing it all? Don't you ever say anything? Yeah, we do. We do. We do say prayers. Even in the Eastern Rite, they sing more than the Western Rite does, but Eastern Rite even does it. Uh, and there's allowance there for priests who can't sing to say some of the prayers. So that's some of us. Some of us can't sing. So uh, one does well if he can. Uh, anyway. St. Paul to the Colossians said this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to God. Singing. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. To the Ephesians, he said, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, folks, are three forms of ecclesiastical music, and with the musical, with emphasis upon the concept of the musical form, really the Psalter is the basis in the heart. The psalms are the basis in the heart of all music within the church. And, and what those two texts tell us is not only to sing, but to address one another in that concept. And you can imagine that. What if I were to sing this entire class? Actually, it can be done based upon the tradition of the church, but I'm too stupid to know it. So you can forget that idea if you have any hair-brained ideas. I'm not coming through for you. I can so, show you. Yeah, I'm sure you could. <laughs> he knows more about this than I do. Uh, in any case, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a very succinct history of singing liturgically. Uh, and, I, and I do this uh, for reason, and again, succinctly. So if you get, it, you get intrigued by this and you start studying, you're going to find volumes and volumes and years and centuries and centuries of material, uh, which fleshed out may seem what I say to be insignificant, and that's fine. Uh, but, but I still need to summarize it for you so that we can answer that question. Singing liturgically goes way back to the Jewish tradition of sto singing storytelling or storytelling by song. Most ancient cultures did this, at least in the Middle East, but uh, it's passed on to us through the Jewish tradition. The stories, the, the, the Old Testament, many, many of the Old Testament accounts are collections of short stories, vignettes, if you will, put together to create a long history. And these stories were passed on from generation to generation, usually via singing, usually via singing. So sit around the fireplace and the family gets together and they're telling the lore of the people, of their people, of the religion, they tell the stories, all these little stories. You ever wonder why sometimes you read in Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and things overlap, and they, within the next line, they seem to contradict themselves, and you're wondering, what is that about? Well, those are two stories put together, and where the differences in the stories occur, they fit, they leave it all there, and let us sort it out. 
So that's why we need the church to help us read through it so we figure it out. In any case, the music was really important. It wasn't just an aside, it was really important. I put up in here, up here on the board, the Hebrew word, the first he three Hebrew words of the Hebrew Old Testament. Reshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. Well, in, in the ancient Semitic languages, they had no vowels. And we go, what? How do you read and write anything if you don't have vowels? Well, they have simple syllables. They don't have long syllables with four consonants on either end and a vowel in the middle, maybe a diphthong or something like that. They don't have that stuff in the Semitic languages. So when you have consonant and vowel or consonant, vowel, consonant, it's real simple. You don't need the vowels in there to figure it out. And many of the way that, in, in many cases, the way that the consonants are laid out will tell you what vowels are coming. However, uh, Christians came along and said, you know, we don't think you're pronouncing some of these words correctly. And so Judaism, in order, Jewish authorities, in order to make sure that things were conveyed the way they thought they should be in Hebrew, decided to create a series of vowels that went along with the letters. Now, they understood that you can't change the text. It's holy. So, but you can do something else around it. So they came up with some vowel marks. Two dots. Uh, so here you got B, R, silent letter, S, H, Y, T, three sheet. So put a dot over that, put a dot here. So if that tells you to say better a sheet. Bara, put a dot in there to get it, making sure it's a B, put a mark here, another mark here, and then L, hello, heme. So they haven't changed the text but they've told us what letters go there, what vowels are there by adding to it. But that's not all they added. And this is where people don't see it when they study this. They added something else, like right over here, they had a little mark like this, and a little mark like this, and a little mark like this. Those are musical notes, and they, they coincide with the accents of the words in Hebrew, I guess most Semitic languages like this, the accents are on the last syllable, not the next to last like we do in English, or the first syllable of a word as they do in the Celtic languages. And it's really weird when you're trying to learn it, really weird, because we're so used to accentuating the last, next to last syllable. So many scholars for years, when I was studying this stuff back in the 70s, scholars were continuously saying those are accent marks, simply because they fell in the same place as the accents on the words. But they're not. They're musical notes. And as Kevin can attest, for centuries in the early life of the church, the musical notation looked a lot like this. It wasn't musical notes as you and I understand it. They were little scribbling marks that said you carry this this way and you carry this this way and sort of like learning Mandarin Chinese. If you don't get the accents right, you're saying something else. So besides that, it's a very sing-song. Mandarin is a very beautiful language if you haven't heard it. When it's done right, it's a very sing-song. I think it's beautiful. But then I like French too. So in any case... Stories were recounted by singing, and that was important enough to preserve the musical notes. Singing occurred in the temple. The people brought their sacrifices. The clergy participated in that by leading them and guiding them, doing some of the actions of it. And they had certain groups who sang. The people could join them or not, but the groups that sang, the choirs, if you will, were the Levites, who used to tell the history of the people by singing them. So we have the residue of that, of that in Psalms 18, 68, and 78. Or if you look at the Septuagint numbering, 17, 67, and 77. Read them. They're the long ones, the ones you go, oh gosh, I'm so tired of this. So long. They're the histories that they used to sing in the temple. And what's the point of this? Well, Obviously, if you've sung the same thing repeatedly, singing ingrains the words in our minds in ways that saying it does not. And I've mentioned this before. I can sing to you the Magnificat in tone 8-1, 
I can't tell you it, the words of it at all unless I sing it, because I did it for so long in the parish that way. So the music helps entrench it in our hearts and in our memories. Uh, and when you start putting all of that together in services, then you have a lot of singing going on. When the synagogue tradition started, it, it really, the first traces of what were to constitute part of the synagogue service can date to the Babylonian captivity, but the first synagogues show their faces in history not earlier than the third century BC. But when they did, what they did was take pieces of the temple practice, particularly the pieces that the people did and participated in and wanted, they wanted them to take them in them, in them and they did them in congregational usage locally. And that created us the, the first forms of the synagogue service all sung, much like much of the temple services were sung. And as you may remember from things I've said to you in the past, the, the, the synagogue was a reflection of the temple, and the temple was a reflection of heaven, or was supposed to be, was supposed to be heaven on earth. And in Job 38, 7, there's this relationship here. Job 38, 7, where Job challenges God. And you know, I love this. It just You all have been through there. We have those moments you want to say, God, when you come down here and answer yourself, and that's what he exactly what he says, come down here and answer yourself. I want to know why you did this to me. And God comes and to, comes to him. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and he says, where were you when the stars were made and all my angels praised me in a loud voice? In ancient Jewish understanding, every element of nature and all of the stars, each and all of the stars had a guardian angel or an angel assigned to them. So that's the Greek version that says, where were you when the stars were made and all my angels praised me in a loud voice? The Hebrew says, when the morning stars sang together. Where were you when all of this took place? When the creation occurred. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. And they sang in the vision of heaven. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us kings and priests to our God who shall reign on the earth. They sang a new song. Now there are plenty of other visions like that. Some of them say they said, see, and we read it for what we're used to. We have a couple of songs thrown in there and the rest of the time we just say everything. But they sang it. That's their image of the vision of heaven was, to, it was that everything in heaven was sung. And therefore on earth, if the temple was to reflect heaven, then everything in the temple was sung. And if the synagogue was to reflect the temple, then everything in the synagogue was sung. That's what was passed on. And the first Christians were Jewish. They carried on the Jewish practices. Early Christianity did not see itself as a new religion. It viewed itself as Judaism in the truest form continued. I personally think that the early struggles between Jews and Christians were over who was the true Judaism. Because much of what's transpired to become a part of the Jewish theological life was done in reaction to Christianity. And some of our things were done in reaction to them. But that's another story. So the Christians did not view themselves as a new religion, but as a continuation. Therefore, you continue everything. So when someone like St. Paul went into uh, Asia Minor to evangelize, when he went to Jewish communities like Thessalonic, Thessalonica, is that? No, th yeah. Uh, Thessaloniki, I think it's called today. But when he went in there, he went to a Jewish Christian community, primarily Jewish Christian community. He did not have to establish certain things. So they were worried, concerned with the end times and the second coming of Christ and stuff like that. When he went to the Corinthians, who were primarily Gentiles, who had no exposure to, to the Judaism at all, he had to explain a whole bunch of things. And even then they didn't get it. And so he had to explain it in ways that we find in the two epistles, two of the longest epistles in the New Testament. Is St. Paul explaining to the Jewish Christians stuff that the other people took for granted? By the way, 
the Corinthians never did quite get things straight because in 95 AD, St. Clement wrote an epistle to, from Rome to the Corinthians, and they were still having issues. So some of us don't get it. Um, we continue to perpetuate the issues. So the prayers were sung, the scriptures were sung, hymns were added in imitation of the temple in heaven. Uh, and they adopted the tonal system that the Jewish community used. Now, if you come into orthodoxy from the East, you know, the Eastern Rite, everybody talks about the eight tones. Well, well, we have eight tones in the Western Rite, too. Actually, we both rites, my understanding, had more than eight, more like about 12, but we have eight basic tones that we do most of the time. In the Western Rite, they're called irregular tones. And then there's tonus peregrinus. The Byzantine tradition, the Eastern Rite tradition, got its musical notation primarily, and its musical understanding primarily from the eight tones as used in Palestine, which is the section of Judaism which dominated all of Judaism, even to the exclusion of Christian expression of it. The Gregorian, which is the Western Rite version, which we use in the Western Rite, comes to us from Ye Yemen, from the Jewish community in Yemen, Yemeni Judaism, via North Africa. That's why I like to say, don't tell me this is a European religion, it ain't. It's a Semitic religion, which came to us from, Arab, from the Arabic, from North Africa. And the style and technique has its own means of transmitting the faith. So there's something, so it's not just a matter of, oh, that's just the Greek way of doing it, or that's just the Latin way of doing it. Nonsense. There's some beauty in that tradition, and it all dates back and can be traced back to Judaism. For those of you who have musical knowledge, if you read about this, you'll be able to see the associations. I don't, so I'm doing it purely as a historian. You want to ask, ask him, he'll tell you all about it. He even knows what those squibbly marks are and how to sing them. I it just was like, look, it's Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> so to change any of this indiscriminately can serve to alter the faith that it's supposed to transmit. It's a very thing that the rabbis were trying to avoid uh, in, in writing out these musical notes and these vowel sounds, although they, in their own efforts, we're trying to, uh, trying to affect or combat the influence of Christianity. But that again is another story. So some practical advice. Consider this, that the music that we do is a continuation and expression of the tradition of the church. It's not just music. It's the tradition of the church and the tradition is life-giving. So we should learn what's been handed on to us. In, in this age of modernism, don't pine for modern music. You know, you know sometimes you can, you, you get sick or whatever reason, you're home and you turn the TV on and some church comes on that's on TV and they've got a rock band up there and they actually do nice stuff. You know, and it's just, you know, if we only had Father Mark, if we only had that in church on Sunday, you know, the rock band up in the front and we'd clean out the first couple of pews and put the band down Got there. The smoke machine. Got the smoke machine, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> I want a strobe light. <laughs> 60s showing, but come on, got to include everybody. Uh, so don't pine for modern music. No matter how beautiful, there's a time and a place for it. Not in, according to our tradition, not in church, because, because of the tradition. Very often, we don't know anything about the way it used to be done because we're too busy trying to figure out how it might be done. And we're missing out on all that goes with that tradition. In your personal prayers, do it if you can. Some of us are tone deaf and can't sing to save our souls. So that's okay. That's why allowance for said prayers is there. But if we can sing it, we should. Monotone if possible. I think the God that can heal anybody can heal our voices and our, our music ears as well. So we should give him a break and see what works. That's what nice thing about monotone. I think the East and Western Rite is actually easier to do because it allows for things like versicles and things like that. So you can sort of sing it and not sing it. Um, one can pray without singing, but singing is better. Keep that in mind. 
Now, in answer to the question to others and to us, why do you people sing everything? We sing our prayers because that's the prime way in which prayer has been offered corporately from before the time of Christ. This is the way it's always been done. And we continue that which we have received. As St. Corinthians, St. Paul said in the first epistle of the Corinthians 11, 23. We receive the tradition, we pass it on, hopefully unchanged. Sung prayer transmits the tradition in ways which said prayer does not. It really does. The music changes things and adds more. Sometimes, you know, I mentioned this in another lesson, I think. You think of a statement in Hebrew, for example. And then you have numerical values to each of the words, since the Hebrew letters each have numerical values. So then you have an underlying thematic uh, of numerology going on. Then there is all these cultural and historical things that go into the writing, and that's all there in part of the picture. And then you have the music adorning and accentuating, and that's all there in the picture. <laughs> Do you feel like, will we ever learn? We gotta just keep trying. That's the, I told you, that's the fun of this, is we never master it. We're constantly being drawn more deeply, more deeply into the mystery, like C.S. Lewis said in the Chronicles of Narnia, farther up and farther in. It will always be that way. That's the reality. And lastly, because of that, we don't let secular trends dictate our practices because they take us nowhere. St. Sophroni, I reread a, book by a nun who was in the monastery where St. Sophroni was in England. And she wrote a book on his, his artistic tendencies. When he was a young man, he grew up in the Orthodox Church and then abandoned Orthodox faith. He was an artist. He became an artist and he was striving for perfection in art. And he loved abstract art, partly because I gather from reading the book that he, he felt like he was creating out of nothing. So it wasn't taking still life, you know, like I do a painting of one of you. You're there in your reality, and all I'm doing is replicating. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to start with something, like slate, and it came out of his mind, came out of him. And he realized that later on, as he went back to the Orthodox Church, those things didn't work for him, and he went back and became a monk. And uh, anyway, the long story is he'd been to look back on his career and his life. He said, he said, Abstract art is like, abstract art is not possible for us because it's creating out of nothing which only God can create out of nothing. And therefore, abstract art and the indulging in it is a form of idolatry. This is from one of the saints of the church. And so we don't let secular trends dictate our practice because this is where they lead, nowhere. And what God has in store for us is rich. And there's so much, so, so much. Anyway, I tried to give you a series of questions that people ask, orthodox answers to non-orthodox. We may very well ask the questions and it's okay to ask them. It's okay to challenge the church. The church can handle it, I assure you. I've said to this to you many times. The church can handle it. The truth can handle it. God can handle it. It's not a dispute of faith to say, why? Will you please explain to me why? But it's a challenge to faith to not get up and keep moving in him and when we don't get the answers. Because as I've said also many times, sometimes God takes 30 years to give us answers <laughs> or longer. I'm still waiting for some that I asked 30 or 40 years ago. So, yeah, I'll move on and trust this, what's been said here and handed on to me, because it's proven itself in a very short time. So, we may ask the questions, but we need to remember which questions originate from without the church and which ones originate from within the church, and therein lies the difference. Abstract art is without the church, outside. Real art iconography is from within the church. And we learn the following things. When our posture changes, I said to this, this to you last year, I think, uh, 
when our posture changes rather than from, when it changes to being from within rather than from without, we begin, from without, we begin to see with the eyes of the church. Remember what I said with the icon of Christ that's on the wall there. When, when the world talks about religion and Christianity, it talks with its back to Christ. And it's saying, this is what he's like. And they don't even see him. And he says, come to me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden. And we turn around and we see him. This happens to me. <laughs> we see him. There he is. And then we begin to describe what we see. In fact, you might try this discipline. Describe what you see. Maybe even write it down. And then come back in a week after you've contemplated what you've seen and look again. Come back in six months and try it again. Come back in a year and try it again. Keep going into that church and looking up at the images and see what it says to you. I swore one day I saw the eyes of Christ on that Christus Rex and they were open and they were looking right at me. And then I thought, now did I see that or didn't I? And after I went up for communion, I looked up to see if the eyes were indeed open. And they are sort of, but they're looking down at the altar. They weren't looking out at the people. So what did I see? And what does that say to me? And each of us has that, can have that kind of experience. But we need to then recount what we experience. And it will be in agreement. We can measure it against what the church has experienced. That's what's so wonderful. We have a way to measure it. So we know when the experience that we have is, uh, is legitimate and when it's not. It can be really nice when it's not, but it's lacking. It's, it's like it's going to tell us how to stand in front of Christ with our backs to him. You want that? I don't. I've been there. It doesn't work very well. And all we have is regrets when it's over. And the older we get before we turn around, the more regrets we have. So remember something else in that then. Everything we do matters. Everything. We can't change indiscriminately. When we want to learn the answers, we alter our hearts accordingly. That is our work, our response to God. That's why we ask these questions, why we pose them, and why we seek the answers of those who have gone before us, who have turned and faced Christ. And they tell us what they've seen. Now, we're not going to have lesson next week. Sorry, I was going to do this one last week, but I got sick. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to continue with a, a new series, which is in Orthodox, everything's tied together. So really, it's not intended to be tied together, but it is. Everything is linked. And I want to talk to you about some of the things that some of the words and phrases used by Father Zacharias, who was a disciple of St. Sophroni, who was a disciple of St. Siloan, the Athenite. And one of the things that Father Zacharias, the word phrases he used, he called the Christianity apprenticeship of the commandments of Christ. Apprenticeship. <laughs> Capture what we're about? We're learning. And we're learning to practice it. So what I want to do is, is look at five or six expressions that he uses, because I feel, I've said this before, but I feel like I was 10 years into orthodoxy before I even began to understand what it meant to see orthodoxy facing Christ from within that image. I was looking from the outside, finding all these words and things and, oh, oh, what orthodoxy would believe about seven sacraments. That's cool. What orthodoxy believes about the Trinity. That's cool. I didn't really get it until by great miracle, His Grace Bishop Basil brought Father Zacharias to speak to us, introduced us not only to what he had to say, and he would say that he has nothing to say, which makes it even more powerful, uh, but he introduced us to St. Silouan and St. Sophroni. That changed me. And I want to share some of those things with you, not my story, but how those words, how he uses them, because 
I think they'll they'll aid you as well. So apprenticeship of the commandments of Christ starting in about two weeks. And that'll lead us up to Lent and then it'll be up to you to go from there. Uh, so they didn't have the hard time. So. That's where they make rectors for, don't you know that? That's where they make retired priests so they can sit around and tell people how to do things and not take the heat for it. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Any questions? I'm sorry. Nada. Ah. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Oh, it is? <laughs> Actually, it looks pretty bad. It used to be Actually, neater than that. It used to be neater than that. I, I have not used it in many years. And I used to know script, but I don't know that anymore. Is script is a whole lot easier. But I but I haven't done that in so many years, I couldn't tell you. I think I can remember the bit, and that's all. So. If you don't mind, I have like a short story. Yeah. So some of you probably know this, but I grew up in Israel. I grew up in a, in a Christian uh, Antiochian church. So at age 18, I got my first job. And it was at a meat factory. And uh, part of my job was the meat factor would get a shipment every other week from either Ireland or Argentina of beef. <laughs> so my job, I was a boy, I was a Gentile because I was a Christian. So I go with the rabbi inside a big room where the meat is. And uh, my job was to flip like the brisket and he would take kosher salt and he would spray it over the, push the, the meat and he would just rub it with his hand. As he's saying a prayer, and usually the prayer is going, Baruch atah and I'm thinking, I closed my eyes, and it felt like I'm at the church. Yeah. It sounded just the same. It was That's like the first time I had an experience with how Jews were praying. It yeah. sounded just like liturgy at the church. When, when I, I studied Judaism for many years, and... I loved it so much that I, I, I always swore that if I, if I, if I could convert to Judaism, take my belief in Christ with me, I would do it in a heartbeat. Years later, so that never happened, obviously. So, hang on, just hang on, just maybe finish this story. Years later, and I think I did tell, tell this story before, but forgive me. Uh, anyway, I years later, I went to Ligonier for for a clergy conference of some sort. And it's all clergy, so it's all men, and, and it's Eastern Rite. And so they were singing Vespers, and I'm standing there listening to Vespers sung by all these men, and the music sounded so Jewish, and I thought, it's the synagogue, and I've arrived. You know, <laughs> believe in Jesus and do this. So yeah, the same thing. Okay, go ahead. I'm from Constantinople. You're from where? Istanbul, yeah. And uh, uh, kosher. Right? It's, it's also in Islam. I grew up as uh, when you're born in Turkey this, these days, uh, they put your, your ID, your Islam, your, your you know, Islam. So, uh, but I just, I just so, I'm so amazed at how this is reminding me Islam so much. <laughs> yeah, the singing, yeah. I chanting is the same. Arabic. Yeah. So I can't really tell the difference when I hear the uh, chanting in Christianity in, as Arabic. It, you know, uh, on Tokyo is Antakya today, yeah. Turkey. So just, I'm like, it's, uh, how can I say this? I feel like it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's the third one, but it's the, mm -hmm. they believe in the same stuff. Yeah. In prayers. You can hear them, yeah. Just <laughs> there are some who scholars who say, and I, I've been able to verify this, that that Islam got a lot of its practice musical and, and even its worship practices from a combination of things, and one is Christianity and the other is uh, from the Middle East, just Middle Eastern practice. So I remember the first time I when I was ordained a deacon in the Orthodox Church who was in a parish that was primarily Arabic, and they were singing the Psalms in Arabic and the Byzantine chant with an Arabic flair to it. And first thing I thought was, this sounds like, like a mosque, <laughs> you know? It sounded like a mosque. But then I knew what they were saying. And I thought, and I looked at them and the chanters were smiling and they were having such a good time singing the Psalms back and forth in Arabic. So I didn't understand a word of it. 
And I remember coming as an Episcopalian, and I thought my first thought was, you know, you could go back to the Episcopal Church and have worship in your language with the music as you're used to hearing it, as you always had it, or you can come here and have it done in a language you don't understand, the music that's foreign to you uh, because you've been outside of it, uh, and and be, and be in the real church. What is it going to be? And I thought I'd rather be here with my brethren who are having such a blast singing this beautiful music while I could be somewhere else where I'm comfortable. I'm going to go find us a home. Well, there's something out there for everybody, but the truth is for everybody. And we won't be happy with ourselves until we find it. So anyway, yes, ma'am. Can I, I'd like to add something about the Western Rite and what we do here is that we have a hymn book and it's full of hymns and many of these are very old and there are some that are relatively modern like in the 1800s, maybe a few from the 1900s, but most of them are ancient. And when you sing these, these also are stories that are a continuation of the stories that, that you know, that the old, the, the ancient stuff, and what we even do in liturgy, that's a continuation, but then we're adding the years of, 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 of um, witness to Christ and the works that he's done in our in our hearts and our land and with our people, that uh, it, it's, it's a richer, it gives us an even richer thing. So learn the hymns, sing them to your children, and they will grow up singing them too. So, that brings another part. You know, collects, we think of hymns as being different from collects, but actually hymns, the oldest hymns are sung versions, lengthy, lengthier versions of, of sung collects. So they have the same ingredients in them, a, 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 an address to God, Almighty God, for example, and then some listing of attribute, at least one, if not several, of God. So you think attribute, things he does or how he reveals himself in his activity with creation. And then there's a petition, the, the essence of the prayer, and then a doxology of sorts. And when the oldest hymns have those, some of the later ones don't have that, but some of the oldest ones do. They, they preserve that. And when they do, you're not supposed to cut them short, just like you would never cut a collect short. And if you want to see what collects look like short, read them in some of the Anglican prayer books, and then go read them in the modern Roman Catholic prayer books. They've taken out the early parts, and they're, they're awful. I mean, they're just awful they, because they're lacking so much. And you would never think of taking a hymn and taking out half of it and say, well, let's do two verses, because it's convenient for us to do two verses. That's the truth. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did too. And I remember as an Episcopalian priest, I used to do that. I used to select the music and I used to shorten the hymns to make them the fit. The third verse was always the loneliest. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. See you in two weeks. I'll see you next week, but not here.